Hello. Our story begins inside the Jedi Temple, out in the courtyard across from the garden. This indoor courtyard held the beautiful botanical vines of the temple. Here was peace and serenity. Odina Tano held a small flute-like object in her hands as she sat peacefully in the middle of the garden. A few creatures lived here, bouncing from vine to vine, some of them finding home in their nests to listen to today's session. Odina closed her eyes and felt the movement from around her, not just within this garden but the city of Coruscant. The hustle and bustle of the city was such a distraction for young Jedi. The city life called so much attention to it, and for young Adina, she felt the draw every time she nestled down quietly inside this enclave of peace. Her eyes flickered behind her lids. She could feel conversations drawing on divorce from a vessel speeding by, or the desperation in a breakup call. Another vessel called for the joy of pregnancy, and yet another ship, there was a joy in the recovery of a loved one. Just like the Force itself, balance existed within every living being. She tried so hard to not lock onto these emotions passing by. To her, emotions came like whirlwinds. She identified them quickly and felt them crawl across her skin. Odina didn't like allowing these feelings to creep within her, but they always did. not She didn't know exactly what scenarios were unfolding around her, but she could feel the emotion behind them. The burden, the weight, the excitement, and anything else within that range of sentient emotion. Odina calmed her mind again, closing her eyes and focusing on the colors in her mind's eye. First, it was a royal purple, slowly drifting to the glare of the sun, mixes of orange and yellow before slowly seeping into a deep blue, and afterwards being fulfilled by lush greens within the garden she currently sat within. Odina could feel the peace swarm her heart and her mind, becoming one with the floor and feeling the breath of each plant in the room. She raised the flute to her mouth and sung an enchanting song of harmony. Every time she did this, she felt more connected than ever before. The Force was a wondrous gift, but she wasn't gifted like her younger sister was. One might think she might be bothered by it, and at least on the surface, she wasn't. Odina was at peace with everything, or she claimed to be. Her heart was with the Force, and she always trusted that. Someone like Odina fit in with the rest of the Order, whereas an individual like Ahsoka was gifted abilities like very few the Order had to offer. The flute sung a lullaby to calm the racing mind, and Odina fell back into her meditation avoiding the thoughts of what was to come. She could feel it. Everything was unfolding a galaxy away. Her master hadn't gone, but he would've if he was on Coruscant when Mace Windu gathered up 200 Jedi for a rescue mission on Genosis. Odina was glad she and her master weren't here. From the waves to the Force, she could tell that many had died. Now the conflict was coming to Coruscant, and the Jedi would become warriors. The Force felt like it was weeping, and she could feel that. What awaited her, she didn't know. Her hopes were that doing this meditation would calm her heart, but they only silenced an already racing head. She worried for her little sister most of all. While Adina may have been less gifted than her sister, she never held any resentment for her. Adina and Ahsoka had a very strong sisterhood. After all, Plo Koon informed her when Ahsoka was brought into the temple. Adina looked after Ahsoka ever since she arrived. They were only four years apart in age, but those four years could be a lifetime for all Adina knew. Sure, each individual year didn't fit the mold of a lifetime, but she believed that in the four-year age difference, anything could become lost or gained. She always overthought these type of things, especially as her younger sister started excelling much more rapidly than she ever did. Odina's mind went on and on about the differences between she and Ahsoka all the time. She never believed that she'd be thrown out of the Order, or that anything would come from Ahsoka's talents. But there was some type of burden as the eldest child, and watching the youngest succeed at everything she couldn't. Perhaps the biggest difference was Odina was much more abiding to the code than Ahsoka. She listened more than her little sister, so that was also something. But these differences never made their relationship weak, it only allowed them to be their own individuals. As the flute continued to hum, Odina thought of all the times she had with her little sister, and it brought a small smile to her face. As a Jedi, they weren't supposed to have attachments, but when her little sister was by her side, how was she not supposed to form them? As Adina got older, she gained new interpretations of the Jedi Code, but the main point being understood. Her attachments to Ahsoka couldn't come in the way of the greater good. Odita didn't know how to word it properly, but if there was a word she could use for her sister, it would be love, because she deeply cared about her younger sister, and only wanted the best for her, no matter what. Especially as, with a war beginning and Ahsoka being so close to the Padawan age, she didn't want her to get harmed. Odina was finishing her train with Ima Gundi, and she looked forward to being a Jedi Knight, but now the thought was tantalizing. Her flute continued playing until her breath fell short, and she pulled the instrument away from her lips. 
Adina then felt her master's presence and turned around to greet him. He smiled and requested her company. She nodded her head in the form of a bow and got to her feet. The Jedi Padawan stood up and quietly caught up with Master Gundi, who was getting closer to the exit. When she arrived, he held the door open for her and followed her out. He then began expressing his pride in her and how he was excited for her to finally take her next steps into becoming a Jedi Knight. With the war coming, he believed she'd be ready for the task that would fall upon them. She nodded her head, and within minutes, she would have her very own knighting ceremony. There was a bittersweet aura to the entire thing, but she was now a Jedi Knight. She was free from being a Padawan, and yet, it felt like there was so much more to learn than ever before. Odina didn't know whether to be prideful or terrified, but she accepted her ascension within the Order. The following weeks would be strenuous on her. The beginning of the war meant everything changed for the Jedi. They were no longer peacekeepers, but soldiers. Initially, Adina thought to take Ahsoka as her own student. She could at least keep an eye on her, but when she checked the register to see if she could select Ahsoka, it was shown that she had already been chosen, just not selected. Essentially, Master Yoda chose her to be Anakin's Padawan. He just didn't pick her up and take her to him yet. Odina was surprised by the notion of Skywalker becoming a master, but she was just hopeful that he'd be a good instructor to her. She didn't have any preconceived notions about him, even though she had heard the rumors. Odina just wanted her sister to stay safe and be taught well. She doubted her own ability to do that properly, but she was willing to take on Ahsoka to protect her, now that option wasn't available. With this turn of events, Odina was assigned to a unit of clone troopers to work with. It wasn't much, only 250 men, but she was okay with that. Unlike Ahsoka, who would be serving with General Skywalker and his division, she'd be based with a small group of clones. Under Lieutenant Kai, these clones would be tasked with fulfilling mundane missions for the Republic. She would also be assigned a fleet of three Arquentans class light cruisers, which is something she didn't mind either. They were heavily armored and quick, so if she got into combat, they should be fine, realistically speaking at least. Odina, like the rest of the several thousand Jedi and hundreds of thousands of clones, would be shipped off to the front lines or their battle stations. Odina kept close in contact with her sister throughout this period asking how she was doing, if her training was going alright, and any number of questions that she could ask. Ahsoka thought her older sister was being far too overprotective, which in all fairness, after Ahsoka's debriefing following the whole Kristoffs' Teth and Tatooine scenario, her sister had a fair reason to worry about her. Anakin was uncharacteristic, considering he got into fights with both Ventress and Dooku within the span of a few hours, which was very concerning to her. But Ahsoka was reassuring, because in her mind, Anakin would be the right instructor for her. This did give Odina some peace of mind. Her small fighting force wouldn't see much action, and for much action they saw nothing. Their unit just couldn't compete with any of the larger units. They were just sent to pick up the pieces after battles. Every so often during these recon missions they'd have a skirmish or two, but nothing too damaging. It would take months and four skirmishes for Odina to lose her first trooper. She handled it well, but she realized the burden of being a Jedi commander would eventually eat her alive. To see a soldier she cared about die wrecked her heart. It only forced her to worry about her little sister more. But again, like most things in their dynamic, Ahsoka overshadowed her elder sister. Ahsoka was, aside from her temper and lack of patience, progressing faster through her training due to the combat she saw. Very early on, she was dealing with dozens to hundreds of clone deaths, a battle. She and Skywalker fought in some of the harshest conditions, and she was very quickly battle-oriented. And even though Ahsoka hated the war, she was a solid warrior, just like the clone she served alongside. She was a child soldier. Sometimes the fact that her little sister overshadowed her burdened Adina. She didn't see it as competition, just more so the fact that she felt a feeling of worthlessness. She never avoided having those difficult conversations with herself about her feelings though. Every time she felt inadequate because of her sister, she found time to meditate and train. It was something that brought her a sense of harmony, but again, there was nothing for her to do. Most of the time, her recon missions involved helping the wounded to the Republic medical stations. Odina therefore was able to establish meaningful dynamics with the trooper station inside of her light cruiser. The vessel was split up evenly. There were 150 men on her ship, with the other two ships having 100 on each of them. It was difficult because the troopers were jam-packed with each other, but they made it work. As they were out in the galaxy, their unit would be deployed for Republic outpost in the mid-rim. The planet hadn't been touched by the Separatists yet and so they were brought as reinforcements. Just as they arrived, they intercepted an attack made by Commando Droids and B-2 Battle Droids. Every droid unit had been secretly landed on the far side of the outpost, and then sent in. 
The droids were simply trying to take this base so that they could use it as a forward command post, before moving to a more important location. As the battle started, Odina used a clone rifle from the barracks to sharpshoot some of the commando droids before targeting the tactical droid assigned of the unit. The clones were surprised to see a Jedi use a weapon like that, but she remembered her mother hunting with it inside of her home village long ago. Plus, Odina was only using the rifle because the sensor alerts gave her a chance to fire on the droids before the actual battle commenced. Her shots were precise, and the bullseyes were remarkable. As the droids got closer, she ignited her lightsaber and leapt off the top platform on the outpost to join Lieutenant Kai on the front lines. He was happy to see her with him, and the two of them ran forward. There were about 40 other troopers from her company joining them. The battle droids that attacked stood little to no chance, and thanks to Adina's sharp shooting, the droids were disorganized before they could even get their foot in the door. There were a few casualties from the battle, which added to the loss of life this war inflicted. Because there was never really anything for this unit of clones and Jedi, Odina and Kai often discussed the war itself, how he felt about it, because she was very curious as to his feelings on it. Many of the clones across not just their unit but the Grand Army had mixed feelings about the war. She could understand that. The war negatively impacted a lot of people, and the clones felt a burden of blame because of it. But without the war, they wouldn't even exist. It was existential in a way. Odina would, in a way, meditate with the clones. She would play her flute like she did inside the Temple Botanical Garden, and the clones who wanted to participate would. Not many of them did, but for those that joined her, were able to feel a sense of tranquility, which really put an ease to their minds. Many of them, including Odina, believed they'd get ambushed by a Separatist fleet, and then they would all die in that scenario. It was dreary, but there wasn't really anything else they could think of happening. About a year and a half into the war, Odina's unit would be sent to Ashes Re to look over an old Jedi outpost. Due to the recent event on Devron, the Jedi wanted to protect their older locations. While information was still being relayed back to the temple, the Jedi assumed the attack on the Temple of Edith was meant to steal something from the Jedi. The reality is, Savage Oppress had no interest in the Jedi Temple there. Sure, it had information, but nothing he knew or cared about. The Jedi seemed more paranoid than anything else. Odina believed it was really an odd decision, but she obliged, as her unit joined her on the former Jedi world. They set up a camp on the surface. It had been about 37 rotations since they'd last been to the surface of a planet. It was nice to just refuel and enjoy the natural serenity of a planet. Of course, when they refueled, they couldn't stop on a planet most of the time. The refueling was temporary, about an hour long stop, so there'd be no purpose in trying to get some fresh air. The clones enjoyed being here, but they didn't understand what here was. So Adina walked with her men and read what she could read from the ancient dialect. What she didn't realize is that like the temple on Coruscant, the temple here on Ashes Re was built on top of a Sith temple. The dark side clouded the surface of the planet, something none of the clones picked up on. Odina did, but she couldn't figure out why. Now that she knew, she was kind of curious. In the middle of the night, when all of her troopers, aside from the Night Watch, were sleeping, she snuck off. Odina went down below the Jedi ruins and found something interesting, bringing it back to her camp and examining it. She didn't want to stay below because it was a little too eerie for her own taste. When she got back to her little camp, she looked at the Sith holocron. Part of her wanted to try and open it but all of her Jedi training had dissuaded her from ever using a relic of their ancient enemy in the Force. She believed that nothing could go wrong if she just opened it a little. Odina held the holocron and twisted it from side to side so that she could examine it. She then placed it back down and looked at it from afar. There couldn't be any harm in using this holocron, right? Just because it was a Sith holocron didn't mean anything. Odina had gotten tiresome of the war by this point. Maybe there was a secret on how to end the war. That logic prevailed, especially in the late hours of the night, and she used the force on it, opening it up just a little, curious to feel a taste of the darkness, but she was pulled in. A little taste became a monstrous bite. She could feel the power radiating off the holocron. What plagued her were her deepest insecurities, everything she had surpassed throughout her time inside the Order, every time she watched her sister excel and had to face herself in the mirror every day, being disappointed in herself for amounting to nothing. She wasn't bad at what she did, but the dark side drew from her pain. It focused on every ounce of self-loathing pain she felt in the last several years of her life, and then heightened them. Odina felt like the world was pressing her into a million little pieces. She couldn't tell what was wrong, but she could feel that something was very off about all of this. Because despite this nightmare, she knew one thing was true, and what the holocron was telling her wasn't the truth. These feelings of self-doubt and even putting herself down under her sister's successes were true. 
but Adina loved her sister with all of her heart. She may have been disappointed in her own missteps, but she knew that Ahsoka would never hold her accomplishments over her. This realization within the holocron pushed Adina to recoil away from it. The dark side scared her, and now she understood why the Jedi were to pull away from it if they ever encountered it. But there was an issue. The Dark Lord of the Sith had been alerted to this. Due to his own dealings with death and sleep, Sidious trained himself to remain alert at all times. So when he felt someone accessing a Sith holocron, he immediately moved to intercept. He never expected a Jedi to try and access the one he left behind on Ashes Re. Sidious knew where each Sith and Jedi mixed locations were, so as a result, he planned to trap holocrons there. They were empty Sith holocrons with no information inside of them, but they were highly fused with the dark side of the Force, so that when an individual or user opens them up, they were surrounded by a power they hadn't ever faced before. In the process of the Jedi dealing with such darkness, Sidious would have time to go in and lock onto the individual, which is exactly what he was doing with Adina. She wasn't prepared and he was able to quickly find her, using her connection to the empty holocron to connect himself to her without her knowing. He was a plague on the force, and now he'd be one for her too. Odina tossed and turned in her cot until she was able to will herself out of the holocron. She was panicked and scared. She thought she had a vision about a mountain, but she wasn't sure. All she knew was that she felt like the darkness was seeping into her skin. Adina got up and rushed away from the camp so that they could contact her master. She rang up his communication and got nothing. She repeated this process again and again and again. Each time she called, she became more panicked than the time before. She was so worried about her teacher that she contacted Cham Sundula's personal frequency. Master Gundy had given it to her just in case she couldn't reach him. Ryloth, after all, was a hostile territory, ever since the day that Windu, Kenobi, and Skywalker took over the planet at least. It was just another connection for Adina, to not just the planet but to Ahsoka. After all, Ahsoka liberated the planet from the blockade. Cham Syndulla answered the first call she made to him, and he revealed the truth. Jedi General Ima Gundi had died in combat on the planet's surface, but his sacrifice saved Cham's people. He was now working with Captain Hauser, someone who would replace Master Gundi from now on. She weakly thanked the Twi'lek General before becoming quiet and sobbing to herself inside of the temple. There were no other troopers around her, so she was able to grieve alone. Ashis Ri turned from an interesting expedition to a total nightmare and she couldn't figure out how to properly handle this turn of events. She couldn't even contact Ahsoka, because she told her that she was going on a campaign that required total calm silence. Adina felt alone, and Sidious from across the galaxy used the established connection from the Sith Holocron to play off of that. She believed that once she left Ashes Re, everything would go back to normal, but it didn't. The Sith Holocron was a power unlike anything she'd encountered before, and once the Dark Lord made the connection, he started tugging. Very similarly to what he was doing with Anakin and the future Grand Inquisitor, he was doing to Adina. She would be the perfect prey too. Being that she was Ahsoka's older sister meant that he could turn Ahsoka or make Ahsoka fall into the clutches of evil, leading Anakin down that same path. Sidious knew he could play this any number of ways and make it work for him any number of ways. Adina was none the wiser, and she and her troops returned to their small fleet and left Ashes Reem. They again would go down the territory of having no combat, but that was a blessing because their commander was suffering more than ever before. Odina feared the idea of sleeping. Their first night away from Ashes Re was the beginning of her night terrors. Without a teacher to turn to, she felt lost, and so every time she had one of these night terrors, she felt like the galaxy was against her. Each dream felt very real, and each time she felt the darkness call, she pulled away from it. But it felt like she was losing the fight. Every night the darkness would come back stronger than ever before. Odina had dreams of her sister dying in combat, Skywalker turning to the dark side, her order being destroyed. The darkness then would promise her the power to stop that, and every time she almost took from the Forbidden Tree, every time she looked at the power and rejected it. But before every dream ended, she felt like the choice was even more wrong than the night before. As a result of these terrors, she searched for anyone to communicate with. She knew Yoda was open to talking with anyone, but she didn't want to bother him because of these nightmares. She felt that he was too busy for something so unimportant. The darkness continued, and when the pulling at her greatest external fears proved ineffective, Sidious targeted her greatest insecurities. She avoided sleep, but when she passed out from exhaustion, she was thrown into a galaxy she didn't know, with people she never met. She was shown what darkness truly could have if she embraced it. She could be surrounded by those with influence, and she wouldn't be overshadowed by her younger sister. 
At each turn, Odina felt that this was wrong. She knew that her sister was better for the talent she was given at birth, but something deep down pulled her closer and closer to the darkness. Sidious knew there was something within her that she didn't know about. Adina had been doing deep dives in the Force ever since her original interaction with the Sith Holocron. She looked for anywhere that she could find redemption or peace, and then she found somewhere that pulled her in. But she couldn't just relocate a military force without a reason. They were here for a purpose. Adina needed a legitimate concern to be able to move her troops anywhere near the moon. And so for a few short weeks, she would continue to suffer with the darkness. Sidious was closing in on pulling her to him. He acted like a shadow in a dark room, or a ghost in the abyss. She couldn't find him, but he always had a lock on her. When this torture took her to her breaking point, she and her troops stopped off at the local moon in the Anishinaabe system. The moon itself was called Ashawi. There were no recordings of Jedi structures being present here, but as she identified, the planet was heavily attuned to the Force. Adina and her troops stationed themselves outside the moon as she, Kai, and another couple troops made their way down to the surface of the moon. They landed in a dense jungle with vibrant colors of orange and pink. They fanned out and Odina called to her men and told them that she would like them to stay close. There was no knowing what would be out here. The Jedi Knight and the clones moved slowly throughout the forest until they came across a stone slab. Odina walked over to it and knelt down, placing her hand on the stone and looking at the symbols that she could not read. She turned to her men and told them that she would like to try and harness what lay beneath. The clones looked to each other and stepped back, allowing her to do her thing. Adina closed her eyes and then she felt the stone activate, as if it hadn't been touched in thousands of years. Once she felt the force open, she entered. But what she entered was something she was never prepared for. Adina opened up a portal with the force, not a visible one, but one where she was able to feel the force around her in a way she never had before. As she was feeling this heightened connection, she opened her eyes and saw her sister. Ahsoka was sleeping on her bed inside of her quarters. Adina called out to her, this being the first time she had seen her sister physically since before the war. Ahsoka's eyes opened and she looked up, hearing her sister call her name. She then saw Adina looking from across at her. Ahsoka didn't know what was happening and naturally rubbed her eyes, asking if her sister was okay. Adina nodded her head. She asked how she was doing. Ahsoka smiled and stretched, saying she was tired. The desire to leave the war and even the Jedi was more present than ever before. Adina nodded her head, understanding where her sister's heart was. Ahsoka slowly moved off the bed and got in front of her sister, asking how she was doing this. Adina didn't know. She said she had touched a stone on a moon in the Ansanabi system. Ahsoka didn't know where that was. Neither sister knew how to explain what they were seeing or how they were seeing each other. Ahsoka couldn't see Adina's background. All she saw was her sister. The two of them spoke, and Adina apologized to her sister for waking her. She said she was experiencing terrible nightmares, explaining them too. Ahsoka didn't know how to help, but she told her sister that she was always here for her. She would do anything she could to help if she could. These words meant the galaxy to Adina. It reassured her that there was nothing wrong with their relationship as sisters, and that all of her doubts came from the work of the dark side. Adina told her sister that she was going to try something on this moon, and she wanted Ahsoka to know how much she meant to her. Adina knew they weren't supposed to use attachment words, but she told Ahsoka that she loved her. She always would. She wished that this war never happened, and that they could have been closer, but not everything works out the way it's planned. Ahsoka understood, and she was very appreciative of Adina's communication, but there was something hidden. What was Adina going to try? Truthfully, not even she knew. All she knew is that it would change everything for her. Ahsoka was worried, but her sister reassured her that everything would be alright, and within an instant, they couldn't see each other anymore. Truthfully, that was an accident. Adina wasn't trying to interact with her sister. Well, she was, but she wasn't. She left a message on her sister's communicator, saying the same things, but she figured out that since she was so focused on her sister, she must have channeled her, somehow. It felt like any discrepancies between them and their bond had vanished for a few moments. Ahsoka had her own issues with her sister, many of them being that her big sister was a bit too overprotective and maybe wanted to try and be around her too much. But these things weren't dividing issues. Ahsoka leaned back and slowly returned to sleep. Her sister, on the other hand, channeled the force unlike ever before. Odina was going to go further. She had to trust herself to let go. She had to remove her focus on distractions and she had to allow the force to guide her. Odina took a step back and breathed out slowly, allowing her sister's peace become her peace, and then she walked forward into the forest. However, instead of being stationary, she arrived outside of a mountain, the same one from before. Odina looked around, 
She could feel darkness here. As she moved forward, she realized she had done it. In an effort to avoid accidentally breaking the connection, she continued forward, pressing her hand outwards towards the ground and feeling the pure evil feelings that were clouding this planet. There was something terrible here. Odina looked up and walked towards the mountain in front of her. After traversing for some time, she could feel something following behind her, and she turned back to see her sister. Asuka asked where they were, and Adina looked around, not knowing. She then asked her older sister what they were doing, and Adina smiled, walking towards her sister and telling her that they were on a spirit walk. She explained how she encountered a dark essence and it plagued her mind. She was hopeful that a spirit walk could cleanse her, but it brought her here for some reason. Asuka smiled at her sister and told her that they could figure it out together. Odina asked her if that's what she really wanted to do, and Ahsoka rolled her eyes with a grin and started forward. The odd thing about the spirit walk is that they didn't know that multiple individuals could partake in the same thing at the same time. Something about the divide of their connection created a stronger bridge. Relationships as they learned are balancing beams. Once both sides understand the other fully, it becomes a lot easier to work together. That is what happened here. Ahsoka and Odina had been pushed away for so long that when they came back to each other, their connection was like brand new. They walked together, side by side, talking like they were actually on the same planet together. As they approached the mountain, they scaled it, climbing up and continuing their conversations. They were laughing and having a good time with each other, despite the darkness, but it was covering their fear of what awaited them at the top of this thing. The two sisters approached the top, or at least a cutout, and then looked around. It was empty, or at least it seemed that way. As they got themselves situated, they could see a number of droids maintaining the facility. Ahsoka asked Odina what this was, and she shook her head, saying that she didn't know. They moved around quietly until a vessel approached. A number of clones and commandos rushed out to greet this character. Among them was a one-handed man with an uptight outfit on. He was here to greet whoever it was. Their preparations were underway. The hooded man smiled and told the doctor that they had much more to do before anything could be done about the Jedi. The doctor smiled and turned around, expressing that he had some new experiments he would like to begin here on Tantus. Ahsoka and Odina didn't know what to think about it, but Odina noticed that the connection she felt was eerily similar to the one she was feeling on Ash's Reem. Adina told Ahsoka to go to the ship's manifest and discover the coordinates for this location. Once she did, send them to her communicator. They broke off, and Adina went to follow the group surrounding the shadowy figure. Why were the clones willing to do something to the Jedi, or against the Jedi? These clones were outfitted in their Phase 2 armor, just like her own men. What could that mean? The two sisters picked up information. Odina revealed that this was some sort of Sith Lord, and Ahsoka revealing that everything was on Wayland, at a base called Tantas. As they reported these findings to each other, their comms were cut, and an evil laugh could be heard. All Adina could assume <laughs> is that her sister had been captured. And with the evil laughter came silence as Adina was thrown from the vision and forced into the air, into Lieutenant Kai. He caught her before almost falling over himself. He asked what happened, and she turned around with a panicked expression, telling him they needed to get to Wayland immediately. He was confused, but she said the Separatists were brainwashing clone troopers there. The Sith Lord was behind it. That didn't mean anything to him, but the fact that the Separatists were brainwashing his brothers made the task all the more important. Odina was acting the most erratic she had ever acted, and so, without consulting anyone on the council or anyone else, she and her troops relocated to Wayland. Technically, they were breaking protocol, but the clones had gotten so close with their commander that they were willing to do it for her. Plus, she said she'd take the blame for it anyways, so it was okay. Once they arrived, Odina took a shuttle by herself, telling her men that she didn't want them to be brainwashed too, gave them a secret communication code, and told them not to pick up anything, unless it came from her. As Adina left her acquaintance, she saw another Republic shuttle pile it down to the surface. It took everything within her to not shoot at it, but she believed this was a Sith Lord that she saw in her vision. Adina hadn't considered what would happen if she ran into a Sith. All she knew is she wanted to save her sister. It obviously was a bit reactionary, but she was only focused on finding Ahsoka. When the two shuttles entered the atmosphere, the ground air cannons surrounding the base opened fire. The Chancellor had locked down the facility and anyone without proper clearance was to be dealt with immediately. As Chancellor, he could cover up anything like this. The two vessels took evasive action before the first one was clipped, and right after that, Adina was too. She contacted Lieutenant Kai and told him to cut all communications and evacuate the planet. He didn't know why, but it was a direct order. She just wanted him and his men to be safe from the brainwashing she and Ahsoka encountered in their vision. Her vessel glided through the atmosphere and slammed down into the ground. When she exited, 
She could see that another vessel, not more than a click away, had crashed as well. She looked around. This was the right place. Everything looked familiar to her. Before she could begin her journey towards the mountain base, she saw a shuttle coming for her. Because it was Republic, she wanted to trust it. But instead, she hid. When it landed, clones fanned out, under the command of a Republic commando. She kept her eyes peeled but moved through the brush. Over their voices in the distance, she could hear that there were two Jedi reported at the other crash site, and they needed reinforcements. Adina changed course and ran as fast as she could through the brush. As she arrived at the other crash site, she could see the other clones scattered around. None of them were killed, but there were two voices moving away from her. She changed course and chased after them, finding Anakin and Ahsoka. Thankfully, they were uninjured, but they almost got killed by those men. They were both confused, but the two sisters hugged and asked what happened. Ahsoka and Odina experienced the same end to their vision. They believed the other had been captured and so in a panic, they did everything they could to get here. Anakin and Ahsoka never even registered that there was a ship behind them. Their vessel must have been jammed when they entered the system. Anakin told them that they were going to get to the bottom of this. There was no sensible reason for those troopers to attack their Jedi leaders. Odina said that they came looking for her. Ahsoka mentioned to Anakin that something might be awry, but he didn't believe it until they started firing at them. They were all on the same page now, but something had to be going on here. No Republic facility was this locked down. Anakin believed the clones were commando droids in disguise, but he removed one of their helmets to find that they were actual troopers. In addition to that, their chain codes were missing, meaning that there was someone who captured these men and completely removed their biological data. The three Jedi would have to make do with what they had. Just as Ahsoka and Adina had during their spirit walk, they ascended the mountain and found a vessel. It was locked down. Adina told Anakin she believed that the Dark Lord of the Sith arrived inside that vessel. Anakin didn't understand why he would have stayed. Odina said that perhaps he was trying to lure her in. That was the only reasonable explanation. Sidious wanted both sisters gone, but getting rid of the eldest would be the easiest way to expose the youngest. So they weren't far from the truth. He just never expected Skywalker to go on a rescue mission with Ahsoka to Wayland. Sidious wanted Adina to come directly to him. She could be an asset in many forms, either an experiment or an inquisitor. Pick your poison. Adina told Anakin and Ahsoka that she would disable the Sith Lord's vessel. The other two ducked away and watched her sneak aboard. As she did, they knocked a clone commando out and stole his ID card so they could sneak in when Odina was finished. She came out saying that she slashed a control panel underneath the main dashboard. It would explode as someone even turned the ship on. When she caught up with Skywalker and her sister, they entered the facility. They were searching for the Sith Lord. They were here to kill him. Luckily, because Tantus was still being set up, it was very empty. There were experimental clones here, and there were very controlled clone troopers. The three continued forward, eventually catching up with a group of soldiers who were discussing where the Emperor was, which was inside the experimental unit. Dr. Hemlock wanted Palpatine's personal opinion on some of his coming tests, whether or not they should be done here or at any of the other facilities being set up across the Republic. They were going case by case, and Sidious was also laying out what he wanted done before the rise of the Empire. Adina, Anakin, and Ahsoka rushed to the facility, eventually finding the Dark Lord. Skywalker wasn't one for conversation. He told them to move in on his mark. Very, very shortly after he said that, they all jumped down and ignited their weapons. Sidious looked over and Hemlock jumped back. The Dark Lord asked if they really wanted to be doing this. They looked to each other and in agreement, they said they were here to end him. What a pity, honestly. None of them were ready for this encounter. They would have struggled against Dooku, let alone him. Sidious turned to Hemlock and told him to lock down the facility. There'd be no escape ease. The doctor turned and ran for the door, but before reaching it, Ahsoka threw him forward and he smacked his head against the door, knocking him out immediately. She shook her head at Sidious, who twirled his hand and revealed a silver and golden lightsaber, before igniting it and telling the Jedi that they could have an easy out. They didn't have to die today. Anakin pushed forward. This would be a good way to judge how far Skywalker had come in the last two years of conflict. Their blades clashed as Adina and Ahsoka moved in from either side. Their blades slammed into each other's with a sleight of the hand from Sidious. He had no intention of making this easy for them. He parried and dodged, taking it slow. He would enjoy every moment of this. Sidious changed his plans consistently. Either sister was expendable. He could kill them both, or spare them and use them as tests, or kill one and not the other, whatever. The main focus was soloing Skywalker out and turning him to the dark side. They pressed at him but made no progress. Because Sidious was pushing the Jedi away from him, their lightsabers started hitting crates and other devices that were holding on to the experiments inside of Tantus. 
this released a good amount of monsters. One of them had many arms, and every time a Jedi or Sith cut them, it multiplied. This particular animal was called a Slither Vine. The more damage done to it, the larger it grew, and it was pretty rapid too, especially because the Jedi and Sith kept hitting it. It just mutated and mutated and mutated, getting larger and spawning miniature creatures with legs and teeth. Ahsoka noticed it first and started moving around, trying to get Anakin and Adina to notice, and they did. It continued to expand, and they saw their chance to escape. The Jedi moved around cities as he tried to keep them stuck in the room with him, but he couldn't do that at the same time while fighting these monstrous vines. He had to ignite a second lightsaber to defend himself. At the same time, Ahsoka and Odina cut a hole in the wall while Anakin covered their backs. Finally, they broke free and ran through the halls. Anakin happened to grab Hemlock's control pad and demand every trooper in the facility to the location of Palpatine. He wanted to make sure that the Sith Lord was gone. Also, despite Anakin's defense of the clones, he didn't believe these clones were even real men anymore. Two stripped other personalities to be saved, if you will. It was a minor misstep, but it would also ensure not just the death of Palpatine and Hemlock, but the eventual decomposition of Tantus. There was no saying in how Sidious died. All the Jedi knew is that one of the several experiments he wanted done got to him, before he could even use them. The Jedi escaped on another vessel, which made the whole destroying the controls on Palpatine's vessel seem counterproductive, which it kind of was. In reality, it did work though. Some of Sidious's other loyal scientists were going to take his vessel to another facility, and then it detonated on them, killing them all. As the three Jedi sat over the planet of Wayland, catching their breath, they all looked to each other and slowly started laughing. It was one of those awkward laughs that turned into a bundle of sore stomachs. What just happened? They couldn't stop laughing because they had just done the craziest thing ever. Adina's fleet was gone, they had left, which she was happy about, and Skywalker suggested that perhaps they should inform the council about everything they had just encountered. Adina was also able to use a secret code she had given to Lieutenant Kai in case she needed to reach him, and she informed him that it had been done. To make sure everything was at ease for him and the troops, she told him that she would return to their fleet soon. She had a meeting with the Jedi Council. Neither of the three Jedi knew who the Sith Lord was. All they had was information revealing Tantus, and that he was killed there, apparently. The Council would then do a thorough investigation as the sisters separated, not after a very important day in Ahsoka's life. The day she turned 17 was the day Anakin decided she'd become a Jedi Knight. Nothing would change, she would still go to the 501st with him, but Anakin didn't want Adina to miss this day. He had heard stories from Ahsoka's perspective. She loved her sister deeply, but she was always so regretful about how she acted in her youth, always pushing away instead of enjoying. Before the war, Ahsoka was a kid. It felt like her older sister would always be around forever. When they were separated and life hit her, she realized that the times would never be the same as they were when they were kids. Anakin knew Adina would give anything to be there for Ahsoka's knighting ceremony, and so she was. Adina would shortly after return to her troopers, which were preparing to move to Corellia. They were acting under a much larger fleet, just for support. There had been rumors the Separatists would make a move on Corellia from Kata Nimodia, but it never came. When the Jedi discovered that it was Palpatine who died and it was Palpatine who was a Sith Lord, they made a daring move on the Senate. They knew the Republic would try and blame the Jedi, and so, to avoid that blame being taken too far, they pounced. They reported their findings from Tantus and used clone intel to prove that they were informed by a whistleblower, one who acted alone and wanted to remain anonymous. Adina wasn't a clone, but Lieutenant Kai would have no issue taking her side on this issue, if he needed to. He prepared an alibi anyways because he knew her ship was shot down. Just because the Jedi took over the Senate didn't mean the war came to an end. Dooku and Grievous became the main duo to oppose in the galaxy. They were the new Sith Lord and Sith Apprentice, I don't know. No offense to Grievous, but you know. Dooku and Grievous tried the challenge that the Jedi were seizing power over their government to remain in power once the war ended, and while the public was willing to believe it, they signed a bill that certified their place was as permanent as the war. They had no interest in doing the job of the Republic for them. Their biggest and most important goal was ending the war. Skywalker and Ahsoka continued working together, but from time to time, she would split off and work with her sister. During one of these missions, they would be on Coruscant. It was that same mission in which Anakin, Rex, and the Bad Batch snuck into Sereno and fought and killed Count Dooku. Anakin had simply grown too powerful for the Elder Sith Lord, especially after fighting Sidious. It wasn't even a fair fight. Anakin didn't have to worry about sparing Dooku or saving him. He was killed during their duel. 
the Bad Batch was here on a mission to retrieve data logs on the Separatist fleet movements, so it was a win-win. On Coruscant, Ahsoka and Odina realized that they were something more than just sisters. They were connected by a dyad in the Force. The Council knew him, and they refused to share the information with them. There was a reason for this. The Council believed, under what Master Plo had said after retrieving Ahsoka, that they'd be stronger without knowing it. The entire idea was put to a vote, considering Ahsoka joined the Order a year before Anakin did. They believed this dyad was supposed to bring a new era to their Order, which was technically true until the Chosen was brought along. But the Council, including Plo, wanted the sisters to be oblivious from the truth. If they knew, then they might not appreciate it the same way. The Council did see issues that could arise from not telling the truth, but it was a risk they believed was worth taking. What they hoped would happen is what did happen, and as a result of their discoveries, the Council tasked Shock T to take the sisters and teach them what it meant to be a dyad. This time together would be incredibly important for the beginning of their next steps in this journey of life. Despite Skywalker defeating the final Sith, aside from the loose cannon of Darth Maul and Savage, the war wouldn't come to an end. Anakin would actually, because of his apprentice, being away from him, accidentally intercept Maul and Savage and encounter a large-scale conflict with the crime families. It was completely by accident, but Skywalker loved it. His troopers obliterated the crime families. This included Death Watch too, and he got to have his fun with Maul and Savage. His saber skill only continued to climb. His encounter with Sidious told him he needed to train harder than ever before, so that's what he did, and as a result, he was able to take the lives of Dooku, Maul, and Savage within the span of about two months. It was an impressive feat, but his main target was Grievous. It was a good thing he instructed Ahsoka with competition, because she and Adina would be the ones to find General Grievous. Well, he actually found them. He ambushed Adina's fleet, and as a result, the sisters forced a boarding because it was the only thing they could do to save the three light cruisers. As a result, three entire ships of clones fought hallway to hallway and corridor to corridor to save their lives. Inside the flagship, Lieutenant Kai followed Adina and Ahsoka as they led the charge into Grievous' ship. He didn't expect to run into Ahsoka, but because she had done this tussle with him twice before, she was ready. Adina was even more so, and through the connection of the Dyad, the two sisters were able to fight Grievous into his ship. He lost, but he tried to escape. Not before the sisters took control of the cannons on the flagship and blew his escape pods in the nuts and bolts. This, of course, didn't end the war either, but it was the final step into destroying the Separatist leadership for good. With the Jedi controlling the Republic, they could finally get an audience with the CIS government. Their work had only just begun, though, but the long process of ending the war would drag on for months. During this time, a ceasefire took precedence over the galaxy. The clones could recover and the droids waited idly, and the Jedi did everything in their power to push for peace. When it did come, the galaxy would celebrate, and the Jedi, as promised, would remove themselves from the Senate overnight. The Republic had reintegrated the CIS government, and they immediately got to work on restructuring the galactic government itself. Adina and Ahsoka would return to the temple. Those sisters would continue their journey as Jedi, but Ahsoka would wait. She wasn't 18 yet, and she figured she'd at least wait until she was 21, like her sister was now, until she took on a student of her own. But Adina didn't take on a student. Anakin would in the meantime become a master on the High Council. Adina decided that she would wait until her little sister took on a student to take on her own. She wanted them to have their students at the same time, so that they could both instruct them and allow their students to have a solid dynamic as well. Adina believed it would be better for their students to have a brother-sister, sister-sister, or brother-brother dynamic. Just something to allow them to have a closer bond, the way the sisters already were. In the time with both the Dyad and the Chosen One, the Jedi would go out of their way to enact services of goodness across the galaxy. Anakin and Ahsoka would remain good friends over the following years, including when Anakin had his own secret family, while also maintaining his role in the High Council. After Ahsoka and Adina trained their students, they both would be offered roles in the High Council, but Adina denied. Her younger sister accepted. This was okay. Adina had come to peace with her sister's shining example of talent. Instead, Adina would focus on instructing. She loved teaching her first student and wished to continue on after him. Odina wanted to open an academy on the planet where she first found her own sense of peace. The council would encourage it, especially with younger members taking a hold of the leadership inside the Order. The Anshinaabe system would become home of hundreds of Jedi at a time. Adina would continue with her lessons and experiences with peace while using her flute. This expansion to the moon of Ashawi would be the beginning of Jedi expansion. 
Over the years, they would secure the Outer Rim and help its people. Anakin's children wouldn't become Jedi, but they would be the perfect mix of their mother and father, while the Dyad sisters continued uplifting and inspiring a new generation of Jedi. For a future face of the Order, they became his first true instructor. This, of course, would be Grogu. As Grogu grew up and became a master, he would always have for reference the complacency of Yoda, but also the inspiration of new and eager minds like that of the Tano sisters. And that, my friends, is our wholesome, beefy story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jenga Fett clone, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure, Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tibbs, CC2024, Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandalor, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was 670, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Daguin, Zeth Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Gunless Ace. 66, Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forest League Star Wars, Airbus, Rex Wolf, Matthew First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Luke Denwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button if you want to be more like this. I don't know. Check out the Patreon. There's cool things on there. Otherwise, let's talk about this story. So, I wanted this to be a story with tension between sisters. I wanted the story between Ahsoka and Adina to be really kind of heavy. Like, there was a burden that destroyed their relationship because Ahsoka excelled faster than Adina. I didn't want Adina to be as powerful as Ahsoka, but I wanted their connection to be strong and then formed even stronger with a dyad. The reference for the name Adina comes from a Native American language for mountain, and so I wanted the name to have a lot of presence in this video, with her having a vision of a mountain constantly going back to this mountain thing, and then the final battle for the beginning of the end would be at a mountain or Mount Tanto. So, I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.